The Daedric Princes are the most fascinating elements of Elder Scrolls lore. Each drips with personality, philosophy, and mystery, offering thousands of hours of study and speculation for any who would dip their toes into the vastness that is the study of Daedrology. It is a field as infinite as the very waters of oblivion it studies. Welcome to Fudge Muppet, my name is Scott, and today I will take you on a journey through the Daedric Princes of Oblivion, a beginner's guide to Daedrology, if you will. A primer for both the uninitiated and those that enjoy a good refresher of the foundational knowledge. But first, what is a Daedric Prince? Well, the term Daedra in the tongue of the Oldmar translates to not our ancestors, as opposed to Aedra, which translates to our ancestors. The important distinction here is that in the creation myth of the Oldmar, which itself has affected the myths of many men and myrrh, marks a clear separation between the beings that helped in creation, the Aedra, and those that did not, the Daedra. These definitions are what you most commonly hear when dipping your toes into the Elder Scrolls lore, but it is important to note that this is merely the dominant elven understanding and that there are other cultures such as the Khajiit and the Reachmen who regard all godly beings collectively as spirits and make their own distinctions and categories of gods that do not neatly line up with the daedra Aedra distinction. We also have the curious cases of once Aedra becoming Daedra, as is in the case of Trinimac to Malakath, or in the case of Meridia. And beyond that, we have cases such as Mehrun's Dagon, which if the Mythic Dawn commentaries are to be believed, was created by the Magna Gi, followers of Magnus, all of whom are Aedric entities. So we have Aedra creating Daedra in that case. Let us throw in the fact that the Plains of Oblivion have a flow of time that is inconsistent with the regular flows of time within Mundus. Oblivion is an infinite void of possibilities birthed of the primordial chaos that is Padme. In contrast, we have the Mundus, a design of limitation, of constraint. In short, the realms of Oblivion are as complicated and diverse as the princes that rule them. Which reminds me of the original question, what is a Daedric Prince? In the simplest terms, a Daedric Prince is a very powerful Daedra who commands his own realm of Oblivion. We know of 16 Daedric Princes, 17 if you count Jigalag, and 16 Plains of Oblivion ruled by each of them. This, of course, is not counting the over 37,000 documented planes, including all kinds of pocket realms, birthplaces of lesser Daedra, and areas unclaimed by Daedric Princes, such as the realm of Fargrave, a sort of crossroads between realms. And on top of all of this, we can't forget that the number of Daedric Princes we know of are not representative of the total number. For example, there is the Realm of Deadlight, a shattered plane that was once the realm of a forgotten Daedric Prince who had earned Mehrun's Dagon's wrath, and well, the God of Destruction had his way. And all knowledge of this Daedric Prince is lost to us. This is crucial to remember when studying Daedric lore, because as fun as it is to draw connections between vague mentions of some entity or god to a a Daedric Prince that we know, this does not necessarily have to be the case. Examples like the Deep Ones or the Insect God worshipped by the Aelid followers of the Flower King Nilakai come to mind. Endless speculation is the only thing to be found in those rabbit holes, and I don't particularly feel like a trip to Wonderland today, so let's keep it above board and talk about each of the Daedric Princes known to the denizens of Mundus. Alphabetical order is a sensible way to begin, but let's feed Azura's vanity and tell her it's because she is the greatest. She is the queen of dawn and dusk, the magic in between the realms of twilight, ruler of moonshadow, a realm of blinding beauty where colors run like water and the winds smell of perfume. Many a prophecy of hers has shaped the fates of mortals, and many of her magics have changed their shapes. Azura taught the Kaima to be different from the Ultima. She with Boethia and Mephala founded a new culture and when the tribunal turned away from them and betrayed their oaths, stealing godhood for themselves, Azura with her pride tarnished, lashed out and turns the golden Kaima into elves of grey skin and red eyes, hence the Dunma we know today. It was also Azura who gave the Khajiit their many forms, and she who broke them from the chains of fate so that they may determine their own futures. Azura is beautiful, bountiful, and full of love, but above all she is vain and her ego knows no bounds. If you love and worship her, she returns with greater love and guides her followers past pitfalls that fate had laid, unlocking new paths as the keeper of all gates and keys, all rims and thresholds. Beware though, for if you ever betray her love, if you ever turn against her, well, put it this way, I wouldn't want Azura as a crazy ex-girlfriend. 
TLDR, Gaslight, Gatekeep, Girl Boss. Boethius sounds rather dark and malevolent at first description. The Prince of Plots, Lord of Snake Mount, cold, impersonal, and cruel, deceiver of nations, her sphere encapsulates deceit, conspiracy, treason, assassination, and unlawful overthrow of authority. Despite typical depictions, he or she, depending on the presentation at the chosen moment, is a figure venerated by many cultures. Underneath all the potential cruelty and destruction is what some may find quite admirable, and that is the rebel warrior archetype. To the Khajiit, this is rather literal. Boethra, as she is called by them, is the patron of warriors and rebellious exiles, and to the ancient Khaimah, Boethia taught them how to build a society of their own and rebel against the false dogma of the Oldma. Boethia showed them the Sijic endeavor. He shared the truth about Lorcan, that the creation of Mundus is not a prison, as the Oldma would believe, but a test, a path to enlightenment, to godhood. Boethia, through the prophet Veloth, pioneered the greatest rebellious act that elven society had ever experienced. A great exodus took place, and the strongest of the elven gods, Trinamac, tried to stop them, but Boethia defeated him and consumed him, called into question his false narratives about Lorcan, and shamed him, corrupted him, excreting him as Malakath, the scorned prince. There are multiple versions of this tale in regard to the specifics, but at the core of it all is Boethia, the rebel warrior, rejecting laws and dogma and using any methods at her disposal to overthrow the kings of lies. TLDR, down with the mainstream media. Clavicus Vile is the master of insidious wishes, the prince of trickery and bargains. He is the deal with the devil personified. He is the master of the fine print, so make sure that all contracts are worded in absolutes and that there is zero room for interpretation, because it is the way of Clavicus to weasel out of the assumed conditions of a deal with some whimsical wordplay. No wonder his realm is called the Fields of Regret. At his core, Clavicus is a bored child who enjoys meddling with mortal affairs for a bit of entertainment to excite in this eternity of monotony. What further adds to this interpretation is the existence of his companion Barbus, often appearing as a hound, sometimes a scamp. Barbus is not only a companion, but quite literally a part of Clavicus's power. A Daedric prince split in two. Not halves, Clavicus is the greater, but it all begs the question. Why would a Daedric Prince split his own power? Usually the life of a Daedric Prince is one of isolation, and this would drive Clavicus mad. He may pretend to find Barbus to be a pest, but Clavicus is a very social creature, and the companionship of Barbus ensures he'll always have someone to talk to, bicker with, and, well, entertain him. Funnily enough, Clavicus is one of the most human princes. Not a good human, but his desire for social interaction and companionship is endearing. TLDR, boy and his dog scam thousands. Hermaeus Mora is the master of tides and fate, the abyssal cephaliarch, the demon of knowledge. He is the riddle unsolvable, the door unopenable, the book unreadable, the question unanswerable. No matter which cultural interpretation you look at, Hermaeus Mora is always a being who collects knowledge in his endless libraries of Apocrypha, and where he is denied information, he ruthlessly seeks to acquire it. Many cultists have sought the esoteric and forbidden knowledge contained within his vast libraries only to be driven insane as they read the black books, tomes of the eldritch and unfathomable, that when opened, tentacles inked in dread worm their ways into the corners of your brain, seeding uncontainable knowledge within, shattering your reality and sending you to the brink of insanity, a threshold which many pass. His realm is an ocean of ink from which spires emerge, full of titleless books and daedric servants such as the Seekers and Lurkers. Interestingly, the motifs of oceans and underwater creatures are prevalent here, and with the association of water with memory in the Elder Scrolls, it provides a much greater connection. In Khajiiti mythology, Hamora, as he is called, is known as the Spirit of the Tides, who maintains a submarine library where Azura frequents, and he also helps her maintain the moons and their motions, which is a little nod to how the moon's gravitational pull causes the flow of tides. TLDR Lovecraftian Bookworm her scene is the lord of the hunt and master of beasts, and of course he is most infamous for being the creator of lycanthropy and all its variations, whether that be werebear, werewolf, or werebore. He is the father of man-beasts. He is a sportsman, he loves a thrilling hunt, but the thrill is hardly as great without challenge, and if the results are fixed and fair play is not respected, well, then it's hardly a challenge then, is it? 
Cheating the prey is abhorrent to her scene, and the prey must have a possible escape for the hunt to be worthwhile. One such example of his sportsmanship is related to the origin of his sought-after artifact, the Savior's Hide. Legend has it that the first mortal to ever escape his realm of oblivion, the hunting grounds, was rewarded with such a gift. Hercene peeled his very own hide from his body and bestowed it upon the mortal, which is pretty damn metal. But Hercene is still human. Well, he isn't human, but he has flaws like one, and when the heart is aching and the emotions run wild, ruinous acts follow. In ancient times past, a Nord named Thane Icehammer unknowingly killed several were-creatures while hunting in the Yorgrim River Basin, and Hercene, mourning the death of his children, spitefully thrust the spear of bitter mercy into Icehammer's side. The tip of the spear broke off and slowly turned him mad. A rather capricious exception to the usually honourable Hercene, but with matters of the heart he can be a wild predator, as is in the case of the Khajiiti myth, where the god Nerni chose Ifa as her mate instead of Hercene, and so in spite, he slew Ifa's champion, the Grat Elk, and began wearing its head as a trophy in mockery of Ifa. TLDR, fair, but a bit of a dog sometimes. But if we're talking about spite and salt, Malakath takes the cake. As mentioned previously, Malakath was once the elven warrior god Trinimac, and well, he was either tricked or defeated by Boethia and consumed, and he was excreted into the corrupted form of Malakath, and so Trinimac's devoted followers changed from their elven forms into the Orsima, the Pariah Folk, most commonly known as the Orcs. Malakath is the keeper of the bloody curse, lord of ash and bone, lord of monsters and creator of curses, the patron of the spurned and ostracized king of outcasts. He cares for his lot and his lot alone, which includes orcs, goblins, ogres, and several other outcast races. But unlike many other princes, he is devoted to the protection of his kind and has before sent a champion to liberate ogres from slavery and another time sent a champion to seek revenge on behalf of an orc adventurer who was denied his rightful glory. However, the Orc Father is also quite coarse. His laws, aptly named the Code of Malakath, structures the brutal organization of Orcish societies, and it would seem that it is this lifestyle that binds Orcs to a life of outcasted savages, which leads many of them to abandon their lives in strongholds and seek out work as mercenaries or soldiers elsewhere, and cults that worship Trinimac still gain prevalence wherever a higher order Orcish civilization is attempted, such as the multiple foundings of Orsinium. TLDR, imagine being eaten and shit out. Yeah, I'd be salty too. The exalted and most puissant lord, Mehrunes Dagon, the prince of ambition, sovereign of destruction, and the father of cataclysm. He is the four-armed red demon figure that brought Tamriel to its knees during the Oblivion Crisis at the end of the Third Era. His violent creatures and Dramora warbands poured from the Deadlands and marked the world with his bloody taint. For this reason, he is very well known, and throughout history he has had a myriad of cults devoted to him, such as the Mythic Dawn and the Order of the Waking Flame, each seeking to overthrow the Order in place. While destruction is a consequence of uprising and radical change, I'd argue that the latter features are in fact more foundational to Dagon's being. As the Mysterium Zarxi states, he was created by the Magna Ghi in the bowels of Lig, a prince of hope to overthrow and destroy the tyrant dreg kings who ruled them. And so he did earning the name the Sea's Flame Redeemer. But his hunger for revolution was insatiable, and so time and time again, he has sought to tear down the power at hand. He is the eternal upstart, kingmaker and kingdom destroyer, the four-armed lord of fire and blood, prince of disaster and destruction, and for this reason, he is known and feared among the many cultures of Tamriel. However, to the Khajiit, he is called Maroons and depicted as a destructive kitten, and I kind of love how belittling that is. TLDR, four-armed temper tantrum when he sees someone else's in charge. This one is my favorite. Mafala is a mystery. Her sphere is obscured to mortals. The androgyne, the web spinner, teacher of secret arts. She is the spider god who sees the Orberus as a web of choice and consequence, a delicate interplay of lives. Pull a single thread and the whole thing unravels. Interestingly, her oblivion realm, the spiral skein, is constructed in a similar way to Nern with a tower in its center, where from spokes emerge the eight strands of the skein. The spaces in between each are devoted to a different sin. 
Lies, envy, deception, fear, betrayal, murder, avarice, fury. There could be multiple interpretations here, but all are related to the follies of the mortal condition. While on a surface level she is associated with murder, lies, sex, and secrets, the Telvani wizard lord Devaith Fear claims to have figured out her true purpose, her grand machinations. However, he dared not to reveal the secrets of the Prince of Secrets. As a Prince of Lies, it almost seems paradoxical to ever truly understand her sphere or purpose, a true maiden of the Esoterica. She is also renowned for the founding of the Morag Tong, and as many theorize, she may also secretly be the Night Mother in disguise, leading the Dark Brotherhood's splinter faction. TLDR hashtag not like other girls, but really is just a psychopath. Meridia, the Lady of Infinite Energies, the Radiant One. On the surface, she seems to be rather good, a prince devoted to the annihilation of undead and to any such perversion or impurity, though other names include Glisterwitch, Lady of Greed, and um, the Shining Bitch. Her sphere is of life and energy, and she has a loathing of disorder, and she is a little bit of a dom. She has a hatred of free will and defiance, and because of this, she has an uncomfortable solution. She bestows upon her chosen followers immortality, cleansed of death and disease, but also of their free will. They become the purified, their skin and eyes glowing with Meridia's light, bound to her eternal service. She is also unique in that she is of Adric origin. She was once a Magna Ghi, one of the followers of the Adra Magnus, but she was cast out for a consorting with illicit spectra, which one could speculate to be Lorcan or perhaps some other Daedric prince, and so she was abandoned by her kin who fled back to Aetherius, becoming the sun and stars. Meridia carved out her own plane of oblivion, the Coloured Rooms, by bending the light of Magnus. Meridia doesn't have a great moral rap sheet, despite the holy aesthetic. She was a great ally of the tyrant Aelid Elves, and her champion was Umaril the Unfeathered, the Aelid Sorcerer who led armies of Aurora and Daedra against the slave rebellion of Cyrodiil. TLDR, bossy, and perhaps a little OCD. She gives you a shiny sword, though. Molag Bal is a rough one, a Daedric prince driven by the desire to harvest souls and bring all under his ultimate plan for domination and enslavement, a desire for total control. Not unlike Meridia, but with a more distinctively cruel flavour. The god of schemes, lord of brutality and corruption, the tormentor of men. Molag Bal enjoys torture and torment, rending flesh and stripping bone, but it's not all physical. He relishes in the corruption of the spirit. Seeing a good man fall is tantalizing. A monk breaking vows of non-violence, lashing out in anger. A king breaking oaths to his people to achieve dreams of power. He loves all of this. But perhaps the most visceral form of his foul torment is his creation of the vampires. He has been called the King of Rape, and this is what he did to a Nedic priestess named Lamay long ago. And it was this savage act that resulted in her transformation into the first vampire. This corruption of sex, taking what is usually pleasurable and loving into an act of pain and hatred, created, or in a way birthed, the corruption of life that is a vampire. Keeping in theme, Bal's Daedric realm of Cold Harbor is an apocalyptic version of Nern, a mocking corruption of Dawn's beauty. In fact, in the second era, he tried to bring all of Tamriel into his own realm with his Dark Anchors, an event known as the Plain Meld. TLDR, just terrible. The Spirit Daedra, Goddess of the Dark, Nimira, the Lady of Decay. By most, she is associated with the ugly and disgusting, the vile and filthy, and yes, her sphere encompasses many of these elements. A patron of cannibals and the unclean, associated with slugs, insects, and all things that inspire an instinctual revulsion in mortals. But she is not just a patron of vermin and squalor, as her base imperial-derived descriptions would entail, but rather, to cultures such as the Reachman clans or the Khajiit of elsewhere, she embodies an ancient darkness. She is recognized as an Erdra, one of the eldest and most powerful Daedric princes. To the Reachmen, she is the queen of the spirit realm in its entirety. She represents the dualism of both death and rebirth, and it is she who allowed Lorcan to create the world of flesh that is Mundus. And to the Khajiit, Namira is the great darkness itself, the force that corrupted Lorcaj's heart and led him to deceive his siblings. And to this Day, she works to pull Khajiit from the right path so that their spirits may be dragged into the dark behind the world, which is one of the names for her Daedric plane, known otherwise as the Scuttling Void, of which little is known. TLDR, old and gross. Now, your average Skyrim player may remember Nocturnal as the Daedric Prince of Plunging Necklines, but if you pull your eyes up and stop thinking like a pent-up schoolboy, you can begin to understand the complexity of her spheres. I mean sphere. 
The Mistress of Shadows, the Empress of Merc, the Lady of Twilight, and Mistress of Mystery, all of these names she goes by. She is a patron of thieves, bestowing blessings of luck on the worthy, or rather she agrees to hold up her end of the bargain after another has done the same. Now she isn't just a god of thieves, this is just how she is interacted with. Her true sphere escapes mortals, but we can gleam a little from her intentions and failed plans. In the second era, she invaded the Clockwork City and replaced Sotha Sil with a shadow, and later tried to use a technique stolen from him to harness the heart of the Crystal Tower in Somerset and use such a power to make herself infinite and rewrite reality. It is understandable that she is still most associated with thieves, given her prized artifacts and her intertwined history with the Thieves' Guild. The Grey Cowl of Nocturnal was stolen from her by a thief named Amer Dareloth, who became the first Guildmaster and the first Grey Fox. And in Skyrim, chosen Nightingales protected the Twilight Sepulchre, a portal to her realm, Evergloam, the Cradle of Shadow. The skeleton key opens this portal along with many other possible things, a lockpick or key that can open many doors, even the metaphysical and potential, but that's a whole video discussion in itself. TLDR, Big Titty Goth Chick. Periite is known as, whether true or not, as one of the weakest Daedric Princes, but the truth is, his sphere encompasses the routine of the world, the less glorious elements of creation. He is the Daedric Prince of Pestilence, the blighted lord of the natural order, master of tasks, a lord of abundant pus and bountiful vomit. While depicted as a green, four-legged dragon, his sphere does not encompass the same majesty as his visage. Many may remember him because he gives you a cool shield, spellbreaker, and because his afflicted followers have jaundiced skin and projectile vomit green stuff, but like many Daedric Princes, this is just the surface reading. One of the greatest understandings is seen through the Reachman clans. To them, he is the Lord of Order foremost. Everything that exists will pass. The fort that rises too high will fall. The clan that starves will one day grow strong. This eternal balance is the work of Periite, the Master of Tasks and Lord of Order. Reach folk see no malevolence in illness. Quite the contrary, lives extinguished by disease make room for healthier, more vibrant reach folk to take their place. Like wildfires, diseases serve as a revitalizing force of nature, a necessary check on the hazards of abundance. His Daedric realm is the pits, where he guards the lowest orders of oblivion, and it is said that he is kept busy with work preventing realm rips and managing daedrons, a position that he is said to have earned. What is meant by that we cannot know for sure, but it seems to imply some kind of punishment or getting what he deserves. TLDR, Vomit Dragon. The Daedric Prince of Revelry, the blood made pleasure, he who tastes the shaven fruit. Have you ever seen Eyes Wide Shut? Well, those are the kind of parties that Sanguine enjoys, that or things akin to the Hangover movies. He is the ultimate hedonist. Revelry, wild orgies, passionate indulgences of darker natures, lust perversions, even unnatural sexual relations. He is the Daedric Prince of Excess, typically depicted as a portly horned Daedra with a mug or bottle or whore under his thumb. A partier, a prankster, Sanguine is not as malicious as the other Daedric Princes. However, the quest for excess, of course, can have many ramifications to the person undergoing it at his behest. He can tempt fathers from families, the devout from their duties, and the just from their right causes. And it is not always just a big party of drink, dance, and sexual exploration. Excess can go far. An ancient Aelid manuscript describes Sanguine overseeing art tortures such as flesh sculpting and gut gardening. His myriad realms of revelry are a collection of 100,000 pocket realms, little pleasure pockets refashioned to suit the desires of their visitors. You can imagine the absolute horror horrors that may be among these. So while he may just be a jovial Sam Gwaven in disguise, taking you on a crazy night out with the typical drunken tomfoolery, do be aware that pursuing a life with Sanguine can end you in the darkest of places. TLDR, can't stop, won't stop. Okay, so we're at the fan favorite. Cheogorath, the Daedric Prince of Madness, Sovereign of the Shivering Isles. Once he was Jigalag, the Daedric Prince of Perfect Order, scorned by the others for his great power. The Daedric Princes conspired and cursed him. Jigalag was made into Cheogorath, the Prince of Perfect Order was made into the Prince of Insanity, a mad god of chaotic whims and frightening uncertainty. Jigalag comes back for a brief time in events known as the Grey March, where he brings order to the Shivering Isles, only for him to be reclaimed by madness and build the Shivering Isles once more as a disordered madhouse. 
The champion of Cyrodiil ended this curse, the end of the Third Era, separating Jiglag and themselves mantling Sheogorath, but this is supposed to be a primer, so let's not get into that. But Sheogorath is insane. Simple as that. He is chaotic, unpredictable, elated one moment, offering you a selection of fine cheeses, and stormy and violent in the next moment, threatening to skip rope with your entrails because you chose to try the Brie before the Cheddar. Always remember that he is crazy, not stupid. And it is often this manic personality that has provided the perfect disguise for his true capabilities. The 16 Accords of Madness are filled with stories of Sheogorath in competition with other Daedric princes, beating them through unforeseen means. For example, in a competition with Hercene, where they were to each create a powerful beast to fight each other, Hercene came with a Ware Daedroth, and the Mad God brought a tiny, colourful bird. Here's a bit from the book. Thinking itself victorious, the monster's bloodied maw curled into a mock grin when a subdued song drifted in the crisp air. The tiny bird lightly hopped along the snout of the furious Daedroth. Sheogorath looked on, quietly mirthful, as the diminutive creature picked at a bit of a detritus caught in the scales betwixt the fiery eyes of the larger beast. With howling fury, the were-thing blinded itself, trying to pluck away the nuisance, and so it continued for hours, her seen looking on in shame, while his finest beast gradually destroyed itself in pursuit of the seemingly oblivious bird. This theme of unconventional methods is through Throughout many of the Accords, and many of his other myths are just as insane. The Shivering Isles is a complex place too, split into the two halves of Dementia and Mania, guarded by the Dark Seducers and Golden Saints respectively. But more than anything, I think the randomness and insanity of Sheogorath can be seen in his iconic artifact, the Wabajack, a staff that when shot at a foe may turn them into a pile of gold, or a sweet roll, perhaps paralyze, or even heal them. TLDR. Daedric Prince of Memes. The final of the Daedric Princes is Vaymina, the Prince of Dreams and Nightmares, Mistress of Dark Portents and Weaver of the Panoply. The Dreamweaver's sphere is that of the Sleeping Mind, Dreams, Nightmares and Omens. She preys on mortals in their most blissful state of sleep and tortures them or spurns them on to commit vile acts. In ways, she is a creature of fear, and in the Khajiit mythological tales, she was said to be a child of Fatimai, born out of her mother's fear of losing her children literally birthed from a god's fear. Vaymina is a haunting mistress, but regardless, she finds many followers that dream of great power and change, and she loves seeing the outrageous sins that mortals will commit in the pursuit of such power. Perhaps it would be fair to say that she is a being that encompasses the subconscious. Dreams and nightmares are produced from such, and her cultist followers have even endeavoured to steal memories from others in pursuit of their goals. Among her followers are said to be some of the best alchemists, and they have created torpors that put their users in a state known as the Dream. Dreamstride, allowing one to enter dreams and travel distances in the real world through the dream realm in only mere seconds. As you can imagine, Vaymina's realm of Quagmire is terrifying. It's a realm of horrors constantly changing, preventing any visitor from acclimating, keeping them in a constant state of anxious fear. It is a realm of waking nightmares. TLDR, Freddy Krueger meets it. That is every Daedric Prince explained, enough so that you get a good idea of who each and every character is. Like I said in the beginning, this is a primer for newcomers, or for those who just enjoy a good holistic refresher on the variety of Daedric Princes. However, I am considering doing in-depth videos on each of the Daedric Princes, containing all of the lore and insights that we have gleaned over the previous years. Many of our Daedric Prince videos are incomplete by virtue of being outdated, with much more lore added from the Elder Scrolls Online, and new insights insights and understandings that we have ascertained. So if you are interested in seeing dedicated videos on the Daedric Princes, do be sure to let me know in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel for more Elder Scrolls lore, like the video if you enjoyed because it really does help the algorithm out. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.